can no longer rely on relative stability and predictability among the key actors in the region. So to explore the current status of the region and its unclear future, uh, we put together, as I just mentioned, a uh, truly an outstanding panel, dream panel in my opinion. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about each and then we'll get going. Uh, Amos Harrell, who's uh, farthest down over here, is one of Israel's leading media experts on military and defense issues. He's also co-authored a pair of critically acclaimed bestsellers uh, on Israel's war with Hezbollah in 2006 and its response to Palestinian terrorism. Next to Amos uh, is uh, the executive director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, Robert Saloff, and he's one of America's most prolific and well-respected commentators on Arab and Islamic politics, as well as U.S. Middle East policy. And then closest to me, uh, Brett Stevens, who is a former editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, uh, is currently the foreign affairs columnist and deputy editorial page director of the Wall Street Journal, and writes frequently and vigorously, it says here, and it's true, if you've read his writings. Uh, on issues concerning Israel and the Middle East. So following their presentations, uh, they will take questions from the floor. And I think we'll lead off by the former uh, with Rob Zell. Good morning. Middle East defined by very different, very different principles, very different actors, very different imperatives. I'm going to offer you five, five lenses, five trends to look at this new, new Middle East. I'll say at the outset that you're never going to hear me use the term Arab Spring. I think it went, uh, perhaps it was last year's policy conference, I went off on a 10 minute disposition of why that's a silly concept. I'm not going to do that again. Um, uh, maybe there's some people here that remember that. Um, um, I will say that I think a far more appropriate term for what we have seen and what is going on everywhere from Yemen to Syria is a term with which people in this room are quite familiar because it's a term that was born in the Israeli-Palestinian context. It's a term that means throwing off, a term that means change, perhaps violent, perhaps not, the outcome of which is still uncertain. And that word is intifada. And I think what we have seen in the Middle East and what we are seeing throughout the region still is a series of intifada the multiple of his problems. And we will eventually see what transpires, but it is still very early in this process. So far, though, I think we can make five observations. 
And if you're sitting in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or Be'er Sheva, these are not happy observations. First, the region is increasingly divided between two mega trends, Shi radicalism and Sunni radicalism. In many places, these trends compete. They compete in Iraq, they compete inside Syria, they compete in various places. Regrettably, one place where they have found ways to cooperate through a division of labor is on the border of Israel. Look at the recent Gaza conflict. In the Gaza conflict, we had political support for Hamas coming from Sunni extremist leaders and Sunni radical states. Egypt, Qatar. And we had little military support for Hamas coming from Shi radicals coming from Iran. It is a sad situation when the one place where Sunni extremists and Shi extremists can find common cause is the battle against Israel. We should recognize that. Point two, Israel looks out at the neighborhood around it and I think for the first time in a generation, for the first time since 1973, it can see that its two most powerful neighbors, Egypt and Syria, no longer, in the case of Egypt, and almost certainly not soon in the case of Syria, will be governed by leaders who have an interest not to go to war. Let me say that again. For the last 40 years, since the end of the October War, the leaders of Egypt and Syria have been governed countries of Egypt and Syria have been governed by leaders who have recognized that it was not in their interest to go to war with Israel. They weren't Zionists, but they recognized that their national interests lie elsewhere. And that gave rise to what has been 40 years of no state-to-state -state conflict between Israel and its neighbors. We should recognize what happened the last 40 years. Yes, there was Lebanon. Yes, there is Hezbollah and Hamas. But good old-fashioned war, tanks coming over the borders, planes flying over cities, we haven't seen it. That, I am afraid, may now be at an end. With Islamists in charge in Egypt, and Islamists almost certainly in charge in Syria. The ideology of conflict of, with Israel has returned to state power. This doesn't mean that there's going to be war tomorrow. In fact, it won't happen tomorrow. And it won't happen the day after tomorrow. But the presumption that the leaders are committed not to go to war, I think, no longer is the reality. This is a huge change. 40 years, I think, has come to an end. Third, this is not connected to the Arab Spring, or the Arab Intifadas, as it were, but it is something that hovers off, hovers off in the periphery. It's the subject of a dozen other panels, but it plays its role, and that is, of course, the Iranian nuclear challenge. So everything that we're talking about in terms of Israel's relations with Arabs has to be viewed in this context. We can't disassociate this story from that story. It's all happening at the same time. Fourth, confrontation with Iran, this change between Arab states and Israel is all occurring at a moment when intifada, either internal or between Palestinians and Israelis, may come to the West Bank. <clears throat> Hamas, Hamas did not win the battle against Israel a couple of months ago. But Hamas is today having its sights set on Ramallah. 
And the weakness of the Palestinian leadership is an invitation for Hamas to expand its influence and perhaps its power through the West Bank. This too is part of the intifadas that we are seeing played out in Egypt, in Yemen, in Libya, in Syria. Yes, it hasn't come to Ramallah and Nablus of Hebron yet, but it may. And if it does, if it does through the weakness of the Palestinian leadership, through the fecklessness of Arab states who've promised much and delivered no, uh, virtually nothing, then another good news situation that few people recognize, the good news of the fact that there's been so little terrorism from the West Bank over the last four years, a piece of good news that we really should stand up and cheer because we should remember where we were just 11, 12 years ago. A thousand Israelis killed. That good news may be over as well. And then last, the last of these sort of five observations about the change in the Middle East over the last two and a half years has to do with American leadership and uncertainty about its direction. All of this occurs at a moment when both allies and adversaries don't really know where America is going. The reverberations of this uncertainty in Egypt, in Syria, in the Gulf vis-a-vis -vis Iran, I think is something that feeds the worst impulses of the most negative elements in the region. Much of this is inadvertent. We Americans think that we are right to prioritize our domestic affairs. But leadership is something that needs to think bigger and see that over the horizon the crisis may be exponentially bigger than what the day-to-day -day concerns are all about. And that leadership, and please I should say this is not meant to be a partisan issue because there's leadership vacuums all over Washington. That leadership, as far as our allies and adversaries are concerned, just isn't there. This, I'm afraid, is the Middle East that we face in 2013. It's the Middle East that Israel faces in 2013. Middle East, hopefully, you, speaking to your representatives, you, up on Capitol Hill, you can help change people's views about it. Thank you very much.